Hello and welcome to the Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Maria Armudian. In this hour, the Republican Party is at a crossroads. Will it remain loyal to Donald Trump and the politics of the last four years, or will it change course following its electoral defeat in 2020? Doug Becker explores. I'm Doug Becker. Parties that lose presidential elections frequently reconsider their trajectories and their political messaging. Following the presidential electoral loss of Donald Trump and a rocky transition to the inauguration, the Republican Party faces this electoral challenge. While their congressional candidates perform better than expected based on pre-election polls, the party appears to be at a crossroads. Specifically, how much will the party be defined by the politics and policies of the last four years And how much does it try to reconceptualize and rebrand itself for the 2022 and 2024 elections? We discuss the future of the Republican Party on today's show. Our panel is Paul Jupe, Associate Professor of Political Science at Denison University. He's the co-editor of the Evangelical Crackup, The Future of the Evangelical Republican Coalition. Brian Connolly, Professor of Political Science and Legal Studies in the government department of Suffolk University. He's the author of The Rise of the Republican Right from Goldwater to Reagan. Marcus Witcher, assistant professor in the history department at Huntington College. He's the author of Getting Right with Reagan, The Struggle for True Conservatism, 1980 to 2016. And Jeffrey Cabaservis, director of the political studies at the Niskanen Center. He is the author of Rule in Ruin, The Downfall of Moderation and the Destruction of the Republican Party from Eisenhower to the Tea Party. So Paul Jupe, I'll ask the first question of you. There's a lot of talk about divisions within the Republican Party. How deep are these divisions and what's the nature of of these divisions? Thanks for having me on, Doug. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I like to think of the approach to this problem from what's become, I think, conventional wisdom within political science. And that's to think of parties as vast coalitions of of interests and perhaps interest groups is the way to to put that. Um, So the Republican Party really is a a pretty diverse um, collection of those interests, but probably can be divided into into a couple, probably two or three or a few more. Um, You you can think of sort of a business wing, and this is the the big big, interest in manufacturing and agriculture and that sort of thing. Um, certainly the religious interests, uh, that's kind of my specialty that you just noted, uh, would be a strong one. But even that is, is quite divided, I think, in, um, to a sort of a conventional sort of religious country club kind of angle, your, your Episcopalian Republicans versus your, uh, your, your Southern evangelical wing. Um, but there's, you know, there's others too. So there's definitely a libertarian Republican wing that's, that's out there and small. Um, but, you know, most of them seem to, to have found some common ground under, under Trump-publicanism. Um, so, you know, to the extent that they're divided is, uh, is, is still, you know, being sorted out at this point. Brian Conley, um, how much is this a party, sort of the description of, of the party is it's a conservative party versus a Republican party. Is this a conservative party and what does that mean? Well, again, also I want to say, that, uh, Doug, thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, no, I think it's a fascinating question between the question of conservatism versus republicanism. Because again, you know, I'm a person, I, I'm a political scientist, but I'm kind of a historical institutionalist. I like to put things in historical context. You know, to a significant degree, it seems to me from my analysis of what's happened in the Republican Party over the last you know, half century, is that you had a conservative movement you know, that originated in the, in the 50s and developed kind of politically in the 60s that kind of captured the party and to kind of touch pace on some of the things that Paul talked about, you know, factions within the party. That you had a you had a uh, what you know it had it had variation within it you had a dominant conservative faction that kind of became you know the commanding group uh, by the 1980s and then I, I I would argue that from say Reagan to Bush two you had relatively uh, systematic control by one group even though there's variation within that group as as Paul was hinting at uh, but I think the thing about Trump Trump kind of comes in and in some respects in my analysis kind of captured or or you know stole away some of their core ideological claims and organization, but doesn't actually fit neatly into that tradition. So I think in some respects now we have three traditions in a very generic way in the Republican Party. We've got the Republican Party itself and conservatism and then Trumpism, uh, which doesn't, you know, doesn't really fit into traditional forms of Republicanism or sorry, conservatism in a, in a very neat way. 
And Marcus Switcher, I know you bring a more of a historical you know, perspective into this. Is this still the party of Reagan? Thank you so much, Doug, for having me on. I think that's a really fascinating question because I think what we're seeing happening now is sort of a new synthesis. You have the sort of sort of Reagan Republicans, right? A belief in free trade, uh, not a hostility to immigration, uh, a belief in low tax rates, deregulation, um, those sorts of things. Um, And I think that's still a major part of the Republican Party. If you just look at like what Trump Trump espoused, right? That's that's a major element. But what Donald Trump has injected is something that I think emerged in the 1990s with someone like Pat Buchanan, a much more sort of populist flair, um, maybe even some Ross Perot and some Ron Paul sprinkled in of sort of isolationist foreign policy. And I think what you see now is a party that really doesn't know where it's going. And I do think that the Republican Party is the conservative movement, is the Republican Party by and large. And the conservative movement doesn't really know how to sort of bring these two things to bear. Trumpism with its emphasis on nationalism, tariffs, anti-immigration, I think we can say racism um, safely, um, with sort of the meritocracy, republicanism, or or conservatism of a Ronald Reagan. And I think that that's where we're at now, is what do you do with sort of um, people who fundamentally disagree about the size and scope of government, some of these new populists even believe that they can use the government, will the government, to actually bring about their ends, which is, of course, very, very different than many of the sort of libertarian, Reagan-esque Republicans of the past. Thanks. And Jeffrey, give a service. Marcus just referenced uh, Pat Buchanan as a potential sort of historical figure. Buchanan was certainly not a mainstream member of the Republican Party when he was running. How much has this Republican Party drifted away from kind of mainstream traditional leaders and more towards different wings of the party or even, you know, potentially extremists within the party? Thanks, Doug. And I echo the previous participants in thanking you for having us on. You know, the Republican Party historically was a coalition of interests rather than being an ideological party as such. And in fact, if you go back to 1960, the group that we would identify as consciously ideological conservatives in the Barry Goldwater vein were a distinct minority in the Republican Party. And the history of the party over the next half century is the growth and eventual dominance of that wing over competing wings, uh, including a a group that I would denote as the Taft style, mostly Midwestern conservatives, uh, the moderates who represented large corporate interests uh, on the the large metropolitan cities. And then um, even a, a, a liberal or progressive Republican wing, as crazy as that sounds now in hindsight. Um, and conservatism is itself uh, not entirely a coherent philosophy. Uh, I was actually just talking yesterday with Sam Tannenhaus, who is writing Bill Buckley's long in the works uh, biography of William F. Buckley Jr., who is the modern founder of the conservative movement. And I was Sam's research assistant for six years back in grad school. And, you know, Buckley wielded together uh, traditionalist conservatism and uh, libertarian conservatism under the rubric of fusionism. But in many ways, those two beliefs really do contradict each other. It was possible to paper over some of those differences when anti-communism was added to the mix. Uh, But really, the Republican Party has been at a loss to keep some of its conservative tendencies together since the fall of the Soviet Union. And there hasn't really been an adequate cement for those two ideological tendencies. Uh, In addition to that, the conservative movement has sort of smuggled in a lot of lost causes, I would say, um, that include uh, the America First Committee, uh, which in fact, Pat Buchanan revived uh, the the saying that he was America First, and Donald Trump then picked up on that again. Uh, You could look at McCarthyism. Uh, You could look at the John Birch Society in terms of extremist, uh, conspiratorial-minded anti-communists. Uh, which definitely fed into a lot of the obsessions of the QAnon movement and other phenomena which we see nowadays. So really, there's a lot of elements in the Republican Party, and they are jumbled and shifted together at any given moment in history. And right now, there is no clear indication as to which will be uh, in the foremost. So Paul Jupe, one of the interesting questions I have, first of all, is what exactly is conservatism? Because the idea of conservatism is holding on to certain norms or, you know, certain principles kind of, kind of uh, contrasted against liberal or progressivism and the argument we shouldn't move t- too terribly fast. 
I suppose, at its core. But I know you do work with the evangelical community or you know, research in the evangelical community. And some of what's being proposed isn't terribly conservative. It's actually rather, rather activist, would change public policy rather, rather dramatically. So what is conservatism? Since, since I study public opinion, um, I'm often given a pass at uh, doing political philosophy. Um, so, <laughs> so I tend to let my, uh, my survey respondents do the def- defining. Um, and at this point, so I'll, I'll try to answer the, the question, but, but if you ask them, um, it's really about the, the power and traditions of specific groups. Um, and so, you know, I would argue the dominant wing of the Republican Party at this point is really united by power. Um, and power for white religious conservatives. Um, and on that, if, if that is, you know, the platform and the plank, which probably was uh, 2020 um, without any other substantive content to accompany the Republican National Convention Committee, um, I, I think they're united on that fact. And that clearly brought together McConnell and, and Trump and, and many others. Um, but, you know, conservative conservatism is, like you say, it's rooted in tradition. Uh, it's the idea that, that the social hierarchy is, is rightly composed around values and around the community. Um, and those things are, are very slow to change, um, if at all, across time. Um, you know, and so in, from that kind of perspective, and others will surely chime in here and, and, uh, and add a lot of nuance to, to what I just said. But um, if that's the way it's put, then that explains why white, uh, white Christians and white evangelicals in particular are taking such a strong stance um, against Democrats and you know, their views against Biden and the feeling just of overwhelming threat to their position, their values, and you know, they think their culture. Brian Conlon, I'll ask you sort of the same question of what is conservatism and is this Republican Party an embodiment of what we traditionally would know as conservatism or is it something else? Yeah, it's a good question. I guess I would actually draw back on a lot of what Jeffrey said and kind of the, the, the history that he mapped out there with what the National Review kind of magazine and Buckley and that group and that group of intellectuals in the mid-1950s did to try to create some kind of fusion between what was called traditionalism or sometimes like true liberalism or classical liberalism and libertarianism. But those two big intellectual traditions and communities uh, have often been kind of, again, oddly fit together. And there's been you know, times when there's been purges of libertarians and pushes you know, in that direction. Because I always think of the traditionalism, the key part of it, and this is something I would fascinate to hear what Paul has to say, is that one of the defining features of that traditionalism is some religiously informed notions of social order that are not present in libertarianism. The libertarianism really is like motivated by that critique of collectivism, that critique of, a, of an overarching, overbearing regulatory state, that slippery slope towards you know, serfdom. Um, and that's just, you know, you have some, obviously some concern with that as a key part of libertarianism. And that's, that's that critique of the state. And the traditionalists obviously entertain that as well. And the, the thing about the, the uh, anti-communism being a key part that or did overlap, of course. But I think that's the one point where there's some divergence is that in the libertarian tradition, I don't see as strong of a concern with the kind of, again, religiosity and some sense of communitarian kind of cohesion around a set of morals. Rather, it's like that the the individual is the the only actionable uh, unit of analysis that really matters in organizing society. Yes, Marcus, your response. Hey, I think I agree with that. And um, one thing I want to say is that I do think that under the fusionist sort of merger of traditionalists and libertarians and their ways of thinking about things, there was an understanding in the 1960s and the 1970s and the 1980s, uh, maybe even longer than that, that the best way to protect families and to promote traditional values as they define them was by having a very minimal state, by having a limited government. And so you could unite libertarians and traditionalists, at least on a lot of issues, because Traditionalists kind of agreed that the best way to promote family values, quote unquote, was to get the state out of your business, give power back to the state governments, regardless of what their true motivations were for doing so, um, and empower local communities, families, parents, etc., to best address the issues that concern them. And libertarians, they're fine with that, right? As long as the traditionists go along with sort of the anti-communists on the international front and on sort of the deregulation, tax cuts, et cetera, in the economic sphere. And so I think there was a natural welding that has now started to break down 
as traditionalists start to look around and say, what have we really accomplished? They seem to have lost the culture over the course of the last 30 years, and they seem to be realizing it. You're listening to Scholar Circle. We're discussing the future of the Republican Party in light of the electoral defeat of Donald Trump and the shadow Donald Trump is casting over the party. Our panel is Paul Jupe of Denison University, Brian Connolly of Suffolk University, Marcus Witcher of Huntington College, and Jeffrey Cabaservis of the Niskanen Center. Jeffrey, I'm, I'm going to bring you in at, at this point since there's this discussion about this fusion, this coalition of a, of a libertarian and a traditionalist model, and in particular, reminded of the criticism of the growth of the federal government, certainly since 9-11, that's come from libertarian circles. Is this coalition still possible within the Republican Party, or are the Republicans risking alienating libertarians with their seeming sort of lack of interest in the, in the growth of the government? Doug, I'm not sure how much sense it really makes to talk about a lot of these past groupings uh, in the present moment. Uh, you know, I think conservatism at any given moment is defined by what most conservatives say it is. And right now, most conservatives say that conservatism is defined by Donald Trump. And its key litmus test is whether you believe that the 2020 presidential election was in fact stolen by a nefarious, if undefined, uh, conspiracy. Um, and, you know, I would think that, uh, again, talking about Trump, which we can get to later, but, you know, there's no way to define Trump as a libertarian. Uh, Trump, in fact, was the least orthodox conservative candidate running on the Republican side in 2016. And he vanquished his opponents, not just through force of personality, um, but also because he recognized that the kind of zombie Reaganite solutions that they were being put uh, forward by the other candidates were no longer really relevant to the Republican Party as it existed by that point, which is to say the Republican Party is now largely a mostly white, certainly working class party. Um, somewhere between six and seven of 10 Republican voters are without a college education, which is our best proxy for working class. And very few of the traditional libertarian solutions actually spoke to the needs of that group, particularly the people who uh, were in the left behind parts of the country, um, which had seen uh, job losses that had not recovered since the 27, 2007, 2008 uh, financial crisis. Um, had seen family dissolution, had seen the opioid epidemic. Trump was really the only candidate who spoke to that. And to some extent, he did draw upon the themes of past populists, like Pat Buchanan, let's say, uh, or the nationalism of the America First Committee. But to some extent, he was also playing into the thing that I think defines conservative more than anything else nowadays, which is just owning the libs, standing up to the liberal elite, however you want to define that, the cultural elite, uh, the experts, the smart people, the people who run things. And that certainly was uh, Rush Limbaugh's stock in trade, the late Rush Limbaugh, who at some point said, you know, there isn't a majority of people who can actually coalesce around any particular conservative policy, but you can get a majority to coalesce against owning the libs and rebelling against this kind of elite. So I think that's probably what defines conservative more than anything else right now. And Paul Gipio, I had a response to this as well. It's really sort of fascinating to watch how especially conservative Christians, white evangelicals have really shifted from being perfectly willing to work with, with Reagan, more libertarian solutions, and, and in part because they were still involved in, in uh, shrinking the size of the federal government. So at that point, a very individualist sort of religious approach that you know you needed to look inside to find out what's right fit perfectly well with a devolving welfare state where individuals are left to fend for themselves. But I think Jeffrey's exactly right to say that that's really shifted. And at this point, that's that's not the kind of ideas that are mo mobilizing folks. And in fact, you know, if you look at some of the, the major motivating events of the last several, you know, half decade or so, and it was really the, a needed defense against uh, a growing LGBT rights. Um, Obergefell was sort of a watershed moment that left evangelicals thinking, you know, we don't need these individualist ideas. We need a bully on our side. And, and obviously Trump slotted into there um, perfectly. Doug, could I just add something? This is Jeff Cavus service again. You know, I think it's important though to remember that a third of the Trump coalition, more or less, is made up of people who aren't particularly religious. And some polls such as those uh, by Dave Wasserman suggest that a third of Trump's supporters are at least uh, somewhat pro-choice. 
Um, and certainly, you know, Trump did not capitalize on these themes of anti-homosexual marriage that, you know, had been really defining issues for conservatism in decades past. Um, and I'm not quite sure about the place that white evangelical Christians play in the Trump coalition, although they certainly are the most supportive part of Trump's and the Republican Party's coalition at this point. Brian Conley? A, a character that's been, been brought up multiple times here, which I actually think does, he, you know, in terms of an intellectual tradition, play a key role in explaining Trump and connecting Trump with the Republican tradition is Pat Buchanan. I, you know, and if anything, the, the, the three kind of bullet points that, that I think in this tradition, this kind of small, at times overtly racist tradition that emerged and that survived in the Republican Party from the 40s into the 1980s, but was considered kind of marginalized and pushed out by more kind of, you know, Reagan establishment conservatism in the 80s, but then resurfaced in the 90s around Pat Buchanan in 92 and 96, uh, was defined really by three things, like economic nationalism, restrictive immigration, and this retreat from the world kind of America first foreign policy. And so there's, there's actually, if you look at some of the details of the things that Buchanan was talking about in the early 90s, there's a striking similarity between what he was saying and what Trump was saying. And in some respects, it goes back to this maybe force of personality and, and kind of media skills and, and, and all the practice that Trump got, like playing a certain character on television prior to actually running for office. And Paul Chupi had a response as well. White evangelicals are still at the core of, of the Republican constituency, and they've been key to Republicans getting anywhere close to the, to the White House. And so their proportion of the population continues to shrink. So now they're down to about 15 percent of the population, but they've been consistently 25 percent of the electorate in presidential elections. You know, so they're swinging way above their weight uh, because of the kind of threat that they feel. And, and you just don't you don't have a Republican getting close uh, unless you have them at your back. So Marcus, I want to bring you in as well. We've been speaking about the role that libertarians have played, the role that uh, our religious voters have played, but kind of also this anti-government sentiment immediately comes to mind because when I think of the rise of the current Republican Party, um, we have yet to mention the rise of the Tea Party. And it seems that the Tea Party and its broad rejection you know, of a large role of government, or at least a type of role of government, has to be at least a part of this equation. How important is the Tea Party in understanding today's Republican Party? Yeah, I think that's a really, really important question and something that I think we haven't yet fully been able to grapple with. I mean, seemingly, Jeffrey's right, right, that the Tea Party stood for taxed enough already. It seems to have at its core a very anti-government, small government, um, sort of small L libertarian sort of ethos. It also has all the sort of trappings that Paul's been talking about, about evangelicals. That's uh, tied up in the Tea Party in some ways, right? Richard Vigory is uh, a conservative activist who was really important in mobilizing the new right in the 1970s with direct mail and other things like that. And Richard Vigory stood on the stage in like 2010 and was like, where the hell have you people been, right? I've been waiting for you for four years. You're finally here. And so uh, he thought this was the fulfillment of sort of the fusionism being reborn in 2010, and people like Marco Rubio and Rand Paul and Ted Cruz, who, Ted Cruz is in 2012, I believe, is that right? Yeah, but um, I think that's right. But all of those individuals, right, were sort of this rebirth of sort of Reagan conservatism in its pure form to push back against the growth of big government conservatism that was represented by George W. Bush. And so in some ways, right, you'd think that, like, what happened? But I think Doug, you're right that the Tea Party's rise is part of this because the Tea Party emphasized more and more the skepticism of government. And underlying some of that Reagan conservatism was also a deep, deep resentment, especially in lieu of the 2008 financial crisis of international trade, globalism, immigration, et cetera. And that stuff were things that, say, Rick Santorum talks about in uh, 2012, Right. But they're things that really start to come to the forefront in the Tea Party and really, really are capitalized by on by Donald Trump, somebody who recognized the frustration and the anger. And he harnessed the fear of Americans in a way that um, it's crazy to say someone like a Ted Cruz uh, or a Marco Rubio or a Rand Paul wasn't going to be willing to do. Donald Trump mobilizes that fear um, and manifests it in 2016, I think. But I think the Tea Party played a role in sort of teeing it up. Yes, and Jeffrey, I mean, the Tea Party seems at its core, at least somewhat libertarian in that this rejection of government, the Marcus describes it much more uh, you know, driven by more of a question of fear rather than necessarily a question of principle. Is that the best way to view the Tea Party as a kind of 
libertarian principled anti-government movement, or is it best viewed as something else? You know, a lot of liberal critics said that the Tea Party was a so-called astroturf movement, uh, that it really only existed thanks to infusions of cash from above from the Koch network and the like. Uh, I don't think that's true. I do think there was a strong grassroots element of the Tea Party. Uh, and it was the kind of populist energies that surge up periodically throughout the 20th century, certainly around the candidacies of Ronald Reagan and Barry Goldwater, for example. But the Tea Party movement, I think a lot of what's been said about it is correct. It was in equal measure a criticism of the Republican Party and particularly the Republican establishment as it was opposed to Democrats. Um, I think its pose as a principled libertarian, small government, fiscally conservative movement was just that, a pose. And I think that the evidence of that is that once the Tea Party shifted over into Trumpism, they were perfectly happy to throw off any real fiscal concern. And the Republican Party did, in fact, uh, run up $2 trillion in debt during Trump's term, which far outpaces uh, any Democratic administration I could think of. And I think, you know, that what really was at the root of the Tea Party was a kind of cultural grievance uh, and an openness to conspiracy theories. And, you know, the sort of character signature uh, conspiracy theory was birtherism, which really gave birth to Donald Trump's political career. This belief that Barack Obama uh, was, in fact, a secret uh, foreign born Kenyan Muslim and therefore not actually a legitimate president of the United States. Um, and it's this belief that uh, the common people were getting screwed by elites that really drives a lot of Trumpism and represents a continuation with the Tea Party. And I'm also remembering Theta Scotch Poll and uh, Vanessa Williamson's study of the Tea Party, which was one of the earliest and, and I think one of the best, which also pointed out that uh, the small government ethos of the Tea Party was really quite partial. They wanted to keep all of the benefits that they thought hardworking, mostly white people like themselves had earned. They were simply out to cut what they imagined would be the enormous benefits going to the undeserving others. And Brian Conley, you had a response? Yeah, and actually, that's exactly kind of the comment I was going to make. I mean, I think several things to, to try to tie in again the populist tradition and the notions of populism to, to Trumpism. It seems to me that you've got this link between George Wallace, Stan Greenberg, who was a, a Clinton's pollster in the early in, you know early 90s, about the idea of work, like who works and who doesn't work, who works and who doesn't work. And then so who pays taxes and who doesn't pay taxes? You know, to a significant degree, actually, the Democratic Party was characterized in, in conservative critiques as a party that was captured by people who don't work, by women, by people of color. You know, these are the code words for this. Um, who I, that's, what the, that's what the liberal state became. Uh, and so it basically taxed people who worked to distribute money to people who were undeserving and, and didn't work. And I think to a significant degree, that was like a defining and animating force within, within the Tea Party movement. I guess, Marcus, a response. Yeah, I just want us to keep in mind that as we talk about the Tea Party and all of these various different, you know, types of conservatism, like we know that, you know, it's not a homogenous group of people, right? So Jeff may be absolutely right that a large number of these people are motivated by sort of these sort of working class concerns of this animus towards uh, immigrants or towards people of color. That may definitely be there. But I, I think it would be disingenuous to imply that a large number of people who supported the Tea Party didn't truly believe in sort of fiscal conservatism and other things like that. And then were immensely disappointed when their politicians went to Washington and ended up doing exactly what other uh, politicians had done, right? Um, I spent a lot of time talking to conservative intellectuals. So perhaps I'm a little biased the opposite direction, right? Um, I really try to sort of engage with them and talk to them and try to understand them on their own terms and to give them to a certain extent the benefit of the doubt. I do think there is a large number of people in the conservative movement, if you will, or conservative ink, as it's been labeled by the populist, who do truly believe in, in the things that they say they believe in, limited government, lower taxes, right, fiscal responsibility, et cetera. But I think Jeffrey is absolutely right that a large number of those Tea Party individuals had a deep, deep skepticism of government that was motivated by racial and ethnic concerns and that that skepticism of government is all fine and good until it turns into embracing like QAnon conspiracy theories and not believing experts um, at all, right? Like F.A. Hayek had a wonderful critique of the, you know, sort of the knowledge problem, but it's a critique. It doesn't mean that all experts should always be ignored, right, at all costs and they're all out to get you. And so I think this sort of slippery slope has led the conservative movement away from a healthy skepticism of government and experts to something that's not very health healthy today. This is Jeff again. Bill Buckley in a 1970 interview said, 
that conservatism was the politics of reality. Uh, and I think we are so far away from that right now. Uh, let's not even get into the bizarre conspiracy theories around the election and so forth. I think what distinguishes uh, the modern conservative movement is that it has lost both the ability and even the interest in governing. Uh, because to govern requires a grasp of agreed upon facts. Uh, it requires some epistemological basis in reality. And it requires an understanding of what is actually required to govern, which is negotiation and compromise uh, across the aisles, because there simply are not enough people in the United States who support conservative ideas. And this is particularly true of fiscal conservatism. If you actually wanted to engage in a serious fiscal conservative program of the kind we actually honestly haven't seen since Dwight Eisenhower, uh, there would have to be a kind of coming together and mutual bargaining uh, and mutual sacrifice. And that is precisely what today's conservatives are not willing to engage in because they see Democrats as an enemy to be defeated and if possible, destroyed. At this point, what's really struck me about the Republican Party was the Republican Party of Reagan was very much an intellectual party. There was this rise of the new right. Many of you've referenced William F. Buckley many times, uh, you know, other authors you know, during this period really tried to conceptualize a theory of governance that was opposed to this liberal theory that really was the foundations was the New Deal and the New Deal coalition. In 2020, the Republican Party platform declared that the principles of the party was whatever Donald Trump wanted. It's one of the things that inspired the desire for this panel and something I've been wrestling with quite a bit. So is the Republican Party less about principles and more about personality? And so the battle, for instance, that we've certainly been watching this week between Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump is really a personality battle much more than it is, say, uh, an, an intellectualism or an ideological battle. Uh, Paul Jubal, I'll ask you first. You, I think you give Mitch McConnell a bit too much credit to say that there's personality there. But I think if we can switch up the P's a little bit, I think the primary interest of the Republican Party is in power. I think you could probably change that to dominance too. Obviously, since their portion of the population, not not even to mention any ideas that they might hold, are distinctly in the minority. And so, by hook or by crook, the interest is is how to stay in power. That doesn't necessarily mean governance, governing to any reasonable degree that will maintain or try to gather a majority of of citizens. What's necessary is to work American institutions so that you remain in control of enough of them to either veto or to pass whatever it is that you want. So I think that's that's kind of where you are. And that really means that there may be some disagreements, but any policy stance that you're going to take is going to draw opposition from some portion of the United States. And so putting yourself on the record, I think, is problematic just to the to the power project. And Brian Conley, your response? I think it's a fascinating question. I mean, it seems to me to a significant degree what's happened is that Trump has kind of introduced like this, again, almost a tradition of the charismatic authoritarian leader into, and the link to the birther comment Jeffrey made earlier, I think is key because it, it ties us into to the Tea Party in the sense that, you know, one of the things I think that I observed from looking at the Tea Party is you realize the extent to which it's like a pluralist argument in some respects. It's like that we are a specific group and that Obama represents a different competing group. How do we know this? Primarily by race. And that the, and he's a president and he, and by virtue of, of being a person of color that he represents a group that's competitive or competing with us for, for, for resources and they have captured the government and he can't possibly represent me simply because of racial you know, identification. And so that's what I think Trump did was that Trump basically took these ideas and, and articulated them in, a, in, this, in a way that was outside the conventions of, if you will, polite politics or institutional politics in the United States and he talked about them as almost like, you know, the idea of some kind of uh, cult of personality. Marcus, is this a political party? This is a populist political party that's really the party of Trump. And so if Trump's conservative, it's a conservative party. But if, it's, if he's not conservative, the party will just simply follow him where he goes. Yeah, it's been really, really appalling to watch over the course of the last four years as really sort of people who claim to be principled conservatives have moved further and further away from truth and embracing and trying to protect American institutions and following, right, a so-called charismatic, although he's not all that charismatic, um, leader right off a cliff, so to speak. Do I think that the Republican Party is now a populist party? 
you know, populism is not necessarily terrible if you can, if you have a statesman who's willing to take the frustrations and the anger and the hurt that people are really feeling out in America and channel it in such a way and direct it in such a way that you can govern effectively, as Jeff indicated earlier. One of the things that Ronald Reagan did is that he, he embraced sort of prudent compromises in order to promote uh, the conservative agenda and to promote the sort of interests of the people who got him elected. And that's not something that we've seen um, from conservatives since I would say at least George W. Bush, who attempted to do those types of things, but was then, of course, faced massive backlash from his base. So I'm not sure that we're to the point where um, Trump has become the entire party. There are lots of people who do not like Donald Trump in the Republican Party. There are many senators who probably do not like Donald Trump in the Republican Party, but they're too damn scared to say that they don't like Donald Trump. So um, to a certain extent, he has captured the party for the moment, but the conversation goes on in the pages of National Review, in the pages of the American Conservative, in Reason Magazine, the conversation goes on. Donald Trump will not exist forever. The sooner he exits, probably the better for conservatism, the Republican Party, and the nation. Um, but who knows when that'll be. And Jeffrey, one of the themes from what you've been talking about today is the way in which the Republican Party has moved away from principles and more of the kind of red meat politics. You talked about the party sort of existing to own the libs and this kind of a figure like Rush Limbaugh or Sean Hannity or Tucker Carlson, which is much less about a kind of an intellectual discourse and much more kind of a, this emotional, aggressive take on the enemy and you know de defeat the enemy first and foremost and then figure out the pieces uh, you know, afterwards. Is that an accurate description of what's going on with the party? And, and if so, what does this mean for the future of the party? I think uh, that's a largely accurate description, Doug. I wouldn't say that Donald Trump has ideas. Uh, if anything, I would say that Trump lives down to Lionel Trilling's barb back in 1950, that conservatives do not have ideas. They just have irritable mental gestures that seek to resemble ideas. And, you know, I think there are actually relatively few figures out there on the conservative intellectual scene who have anything like uh, the eclecticism of, of a William F. Buckley Jr. or the intellectual depth, frankly. Uh, but it is true that, you know, the, Re the Republican Party under Reagan did try to present itself as the party of ideas. And you can see a real deterioration at institutions like Heritage, let's say, uh, that supplied, you know, an actual serious policy operating manual for the incoming Republican classes in the early 1980s. And that would be more or less incapable of producing anything with that kind of heft. Um, but that's also a consequence of the marginalization of other factions within the Republican Party that I spoke about earlier and wrote about. Uh, to the extent that Reaganism had a kind of uh, economic rationale, it was supply side economics, which came largely from the moderate wing of the Republican Party. Uh, we're talking about figures like George Gilder, Richard Ron, uh, politicians like Jack Kemp, or William Steiger. Um, and there simply is no more moderate wing of the party. Uh, and in fact, the decline of the party's idea making capacity goes hand in hand for similar reasons with its decline of its ability to get those kind of college educated suburban voters who once were uh, quite important to the Republican Party's overall electorate. So really we're seeing a kind of deterioration of both the governing capacity and the idea generating ability of the Republican Party and the conservative movement. Now, Paul, I know you do work on public opinion. It seems that this kind of red meat issues the Republicans have been focusing on are particularly attractive to certain, certain types of voters. Is that accurate? Does that mean ultimately that this kind of reactive politics is likely to going to continue within the Republican Party? That's my best guess. You know, and again, the, this is lack of a less of a coherent um, set of policy ideas than it is really sort of searching around with the flashlight until you find something uh, that's going to mobilize a, you know, a good chunk of basically white constituents um, and a few others, uh, you know, so that that may be immigrants at one point, it may be Muslims for a little while. And you can, you know, look at the the arc of the, the Trump administration, and they're really focused on different sort of outgroups at different points um, to mobilize, you know, in some ways, it was a gift to have the George Floyd protest for Trump, he sort of ate that up. But like Muslims, you know, they were 
core concern in the 2016 election and lasted for several months into 2017, and then it sort of faded out. So, you know, a, red meat is is kind of funny because we still tend to think that it has some substance to it. Um, these are real policy proposals, and, and instead, it's this sort of ongoing collection of grievances targeted, you know, pinned down to outgroups that enough voters don't like that they think they can maintain power. And Brian, your response? I was going to say that I don't dispute uh, Jeffrey's claim about whether or not that looks like the Republican Party may have lost its governing and maybe intellectual capacity. But I think one of the things we have to recognize here is what it hasn't lost is it hasn't lost its organizing capacity or its capacity to generate enthusiasm. And to a significant degree, I think that's probably what's happening in U.S. politics now, is that you've got both these parties are pretty much devoid of some kind of governing worldviews. But what you do have on the Republican side, is you did have, at least in Trump, in office and is still a figure in the party, someone who generated enthusiasm amongst a, an electorate that is generally unenthusiastic about politics. That, I think, is a, is a significant variable. For example, I, I saw a tweet uh, right in the midst of the, of the witness debacle last weekend with the Democrats. Someone said the Democrats just lost the midterm election when they decided not to call witnesses. We'll see, two years. But I have a feeling that I'm going to be thinking about that tweet for the next two years, and it's probably true. That, I think, is the dilemma for the Democrats. And particularly with Joe Biden, this was one of his big challenges, is to continue to connect with particularly young people, certain demographics within the within the Democratic coalition that are just not particularly enthusiastic about him, not particularly enthusiastic about government, and traditionally don't show up in midterm elections. So you got that on one side, and then you've got Trump on the other side, where Trump continues to have this incredible level of engagement. You know, if you look at the, the number of retweets or likes on, on Trump's Twitter, which again was suspended, but if you look back to January 8th and back, Biden right now, president, is getting maybe four, five, six million likes. D Donald Trump is getting several hundred, many, many more. This is uh, Jeff Cabot Service again. You know, uh, there is no doubt that Donald Trump was able to stoke the intensity of his followers to a white hot pitch. But I think that was actually uh, one of his weaknesses rather than a strength. Barry Goldwater's followers thought that he was bound to win the 1964 presidential election for the same reason, because they were completely devoted and dedicated to the Goldwater cause. And instead, they uh, produced a wipeout, not just at the presidential level, but all along the ballot to the extent that it led to democratic dominance that enabled Johnson to pass what amounted to a second New Deal. The Trump failure didn't quite produce results on that level. In fact, the results were somewhat more encouraging for the Republicans at the House level. But the fact remains that Trump cost the Republican Party the White House, the majority of the House, and the majority of the Senate. The last Republican president to accomplish that, the last president of any party, was Herbert Hoover in 1932. Uh, the reality is that stoking that intensity of your followers uh, by feeding them this kind of uh, what they want to hear to make them really riled up actually only riles up the other side more. So it's true that Donald Trump did achieve what would have been a record turnout of 74 million voters, but in fact, this provoked the Democrats to turn out 81. So, you know, just to go back to some theme that we've been talking about. Donald Trump could have easily won re-election, I think, if he had taken government a little more seriously and had realized that he was elected as a populist, and then simply brought in people who could have put some uh, flesh on the bones of the idea of populism, put actual policy there. Infrastructure week became a joke. But if Donald Trump had led with that, instead of allowing the Paul Ryan wing of the Republican Party to convince him that repealing Obamacare was the thing to do, then I think he would be pretty comfortably reelected in 2020. And you can go down the list for a lot of other genuine populist policies he could have followed, but chose not to. You're listening to Scholar Circle. We're discussing the future of the Republican Party in light of the electoral defeat of Donald Trump and the shadow Donald Trump is casting over the party. Our panel is Paul Jupe of Denison University, Brian Connolly of Suffolk University, Marcus Witcher of Huntington College, and Jeffrey Cabaservis of the Niskanen Center. So Brian, your response. I think that's right. There's a lot of problems with that, with purely focusing on the enthusiasm. But the thing about it is, let's think about this for a second. In 2020, despite the level of absolute rage that the Democratic base has at Trump, they lost 13 seats in the House and they got broke even in the in the Senate. I mean, look, if, if Trump was the best and if and if you if you have that kind of 50 50 or two sides of a coin where, yes, he in, in, excites his ba base, but he incites the other side, then I would say that 2020 hints at the fact that it seems like excitement is more sustaining or more powerful than incitement just in the numbers, just in the numbers. It, it just didn't work sufficiently to bring out the Democratic base. Marcus, your response? 
Yeah, so I think it'll be really, really interesting to see whether or not a more responsible Republican figure, someone like a Nikki Haley, or someone like a Tim Scott, or someone like a Ted Cruz, although he may have just done himself in with the debacle in Texas, somebody like that could potentially maintain the enthusiasm and get those folks out to vote who Donald Trump got out to vote for the first time in a long time. If they could do that while not alienating sort of the folks in the suburbs that Jeffries talked about, because that seems to be the key moving forward, is combining those two things in something that resembles a reasonable sort of conservatism moving forward or, or a reasonable populism moving forward. And you can still throw the red meat out that Paul's talked about from time to time, as long as you have someone connecting the dots into some semblance of like, this makes sense and this is sort of what we stand for and this is our platform. Um, and we can bring in the folks who are enthusiastic about the blue collar issues while not alienating, you know, people who are sort of white collar uh, suburban uh, voters as well. Now, Paul, we've been focusing, when I mentioned personality, it was sort of like a Mitch McConnell versus Donald Trump. But I'm also thinking about the role that personalities generally play in politics. 2018, really, the messaging of the Democratic Party was defined largely by this group of congressional representatives led by Alexander Ocasio-Cortez, the squad. Republicans seem to have their own version of the squad. Uh, I'm not sure many Republicans are happy that Marjorie, you know, Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert, you know, as two figures have grabbed so many headlines. But how much do these figures, which the party really doesn't control all that much, and I always think it, a lot of it has to do with funding, that they have the ability to raise money actually by being more outrageous than necessarily good foot soldiers within the party. How problematic is that? That figures I don't think most in the Republican Party would like to be their representatives are actually getting so much press. It's a deep problem long term for the party, especially at a, at a point where they're actually called to act and to offer a reasonable alternative. I mean, so that's kind of the, the dilemma that the Republicans face is we're really far removed from having a debate about the party that takes place in sort of conservative, classic conservative media and these, these thoughtful magazines. And instead, you're, I mean, you see the kinds of actors that are coming up and who are, you know, frankly, representative of where the party is. Um, so I don't know quite how you, you generate a, a platform committee that's, you know, two thirds full of QAnon supporters. I just don't think, you, you know, you generate policy proposals off of that. And that's really where the Republican Party is at the point at this point. Um, there's a huge constituency there that actually believes in, in QAnon. There is majority support for the use of force to stop the slide of, of American civilization as they see it. So we're, we're pretty far removed from a place where we can start a reasonable dialogue or they can start a you know, reasonable dialogue of what, what their policy future is. And it really is you know, the ability to, to generate support and to connect with this new group of voters. That's pretty far out there. Jeffrey, how your research was on the downfall of moderation. And when I first you know, think of the downfall of moderation, I think of it as in part, the parties themselves don't really control their messaging. They don't control funding and with all the different ways you know, to raise money and to get your messages out. Is this just a case where the, the party, the Republican Party, and likely the Democratic Party as well, is this going to be a collective of, uh, of personalities rather than any sort of consistent message? You know, I think one of the clear themes of the past half century has been the uh, declining ability of Republican gatekeepers and even conservative movement gatekeepers to control the extremes. Um, so for example, uh, William F. Buckley Jr. as the head of the conservative movement really in the mid 1960s, anathematized the John Birchers uh, and also Ayn Rand's followers uh, in the belief that these uh, forms of extremism, particularly the kinds of the Birchers conspiratorialism uh, made the Republican party look uh, pathological and ridiculous. Um, and that the middle class voters whom Buckley coveted for the Republican Party, uh, if they were being offered the kind of drivel offered by Robert Welch, would pass by Crackpot Alley and vote for the liberals. Um, and I think there was just a sort of belief that you can't actually challenge the base, that that's too dangerous. Uh, this is also a consequence of gerrymandering and computer driven redistricting, which means that most districts uh, at the House level are completely safe for the dominant party, and therefore the only election that matters is the primary. And generally speaking, since primaries are low turnout voters, they are dominated by 
organized factions like conservative evangelicals whose churches uh, can bust them to the polls, uh, as well as the most extreme and fanatical uh, voters in the party. Uh, and this is you know, a real weakness from, let's say, the perspective of Mitch McConnell, and part of the reason you're seeing the disagreement between him and Donald Trump. There was no way the Republican Party should have lost both of those Georgia Senate elections. Uh, and on normal conditions, it would not have. It's just that Donald Trump actually alienated uh, a lot of people who used to vote Republican, even at the same time that Stacey Abrams and other Democratic actors were turning up uh, their own base. Um, and so the reality is that the Republican Party is in a situation where it cannot stand up to its base because it has lost that gatekeeping function. Uh, and the base uh, tends to favor candidates who are usually unelectable uh, in general elections, except in the most uh, red of districts or states. And even there, it's not clear uh, as to whether some of them can actually win elections, particularly as someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene becomes the face of the Republican Party uh, with her calls to execute uh, members of the opposing uh, party, uh, the belief that Jews are firing lasers from space, and you can just go down and down and down the kind of absurdities that she's proffering. And Marcus Witcher, um, what ultimately um, could be done from Republicans to try to manage some of the more extreme elements, the ones we've listed, and of course, what's, what we've referenced throughout the, um, throughout the show, conspiracy theories like QAnon, which may play to so-called Republican base, but certainly don't play broadly to the American public. A spine uh, would be nice, right? Among sort of the leadership in the GOP and especially among the leadership of the conservative movement, people who are in positions of power in Washington who work for Conservative Inc. have to call out the crackpot conspiracy theorists. I mean, we don't have a William F. Buckley anymore, right? But there are individuals who can speak to these various groups of people um, these various factions within the Republican Party and, and try to sort of um, start the really long process. I'm a historian, okay? I don't think the Republican Party is going to come back to some semblance of normalcy in 2022 or 2024. I'm thinking of like a 10-year project, okay? A 10-year project to rehabilitate the respectability of the party in the uh, minds of suburban America white collar America. If you want to do that, you're going to have to start. I mean, first of all, Donald Trump has to exit at some point. Um, hopefully it's sooner rather than later for conservatives sake, but he has to exit at some point. Um, and people like Nikki Haley and people like Marco Rubio and people like Ted Cruz and people, you know, who like Tim Scott have got to come forward and they have to find a way to bridge the populists and, conserv and sort of mainstream conservatives together in some, uh, uh, upon some semblance of, of unity that's not based on fusionism or maybe a new fusionism. But I think it's a really long task. Um, and I would say, ask me in 10 years and uh, I'll tell you whether or not they were successful, right? Um, I think it's gonna take a long time. Yes, uh, Brian Conley. Again, I'd make a pluralist argument here. I think so long as a threat of a primary from the right is valid, there really is no leadership in the Republican party. You know, in some respects here, we've got a situation where there's no base in the Democratic Party and there's, and there's nothing but a base in the Republican Party. Um, but if you, but if, again, if, if, if a threat of a primary is valid and we can see this working, uh, you know, how does it operationalize? It's operationalized through the fact that you've got mobilized, enthusiastic groups of, groups of voters in every congressional district in the United States. And that, that has real power. I mean, that is what Trump, that is Trumpism, that is Trump. You know, Trump, despite his ability to articulate or claim whatever he wants, he'd be utterly powerless if he didn't have enthusiastic supporters in every congressional district in the United States. And uh, Paul Chup, I'll give you the last word on this question. Political parties really have lost the, the ability to gatekeep um, the membership of their parties and who their nominees are going to be since, since the 1970s, uh, 70s reforms. And so it's in many ways no surprising that this is happening, but it was really accelerated by the Citizens United decision, which just flooded money into the system that was outside of the political party's control. So, you know, if there's one thing that the parties could do at this point um, to kind of bring back some, some rationality to the process and, and think really, what does it take to, to win, um, to win a true majority of the population? It's, it's end Citizens United and start channeling money through the political parties so they have an instrument of control over there their nominees and, um, and members of the party. So with that, I want to 
thank our guests. We've been discussing the future of the Republican Party, the shadow that Donald Trump casts over the party. How should the party try to regroup after the electoral loss in 2020, whether or not they're likely to, and the role that, that political gatekeepers continue that they could potentially play or no longer play with our political parties. I want to thank our guests. Our panel has been Paul Jupe, Associate Professor of Political Science at Denison University. He is the co-editor of the Evangelical Crackup, The Future of the Evangelical Republican Coalition. Brian Connolly, Professor of Political Science and Legal Studies in the Government Department of Suffolk University. He's the author of The Rise of the Republican Right from Gold Goldwater to Reagan. Marcus Witcher, Assistant Professor in the History Department at Huntington College. He's the author of Getting Right with Reagan, The Struggle for True Conservatism, 1980 to 2016. And Jeffrey Cabaservice, Director of Political Studies at the Niskanen Center. He's the author of Rise and Rule, The Downfall of Moderation and the Destruction of the Republican Party from Eisenhower to the Tea Party. I wanna thank you all very, very much. Thank you to our guests and to you for listening. The Scholars Circle team includes Doug Becker and Lillian Inc., contributing hosts, Ankine Agassian and Melissa Chiprin, managing producers, Sud Dongre, our webmaster, Tim Page and Mike Hurst, engineers and technical support. I'm Maria Armudian, and we'll see you next week.